Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Let's get started. Um, cool. So programming assignment one should be out like now. Uh, and you all should have signed up for Teams, I think, last week. Uh, if you didn't, we randomly assigned the people who didn't sign up. Uh, so let me know if there are any issues. And yeah. So the first one is on MPI, which we will be doing part of today. So today in two halves, the first half is about a little bit about network topologies, and the second half is about MPI syntax, uh, and then we'll continue in the following lecture. Well, the next lecture will be about prefix zones, but after that, we'll go back to MPI. Um, and yeah, the first PA should be fairly straightforward, but if you have any issues, let me know. And uh, the caching homework is due Wednesday. Any questions? Any issues? Good. All right, let's get started. So um, I said this at the beginning in the first lecture, but we're going to move on to distributed memory now. And in distributed memory, uh, there are multiple processors, each with their own memory. So every processor has a separate memory connected to it, and they're all connected through the network. And they connect, uh, they, they communicate usually through message passing. And this setup is usually also called a cluster, and a high-performance computer can have hundreds or thousands of these. They're called nodes, usually, or, uh, yeah, they're processors, or sometimes they're nodes when you describe the size of these things. And if you remember this plot from the beginning, um, this is time, which is the x-axis, and this is the percentage share of, in some sense, like high-performance programs. And up to about, maybe like 2005 or so, a lot of the benefit came from multi-parallel uh, processing, like multi-threaded parallel processing, like we were doing in previous classes with work span analysis. That's this yellow part. And this orange part, orange part, is the cluster. So starting here, you can see a huge fraction of the codes are now in cluster computing. And serial programs, uh, you can get multiple, uh, you can get parallel programs here by annotating serial programs like we were doing with Spawn and Sync. However, with cluster computing, you have to rewrite the program using message passing, pretty much. You have to write it in a different paradigm. This is an example of one of these um, multiprocessing, one of these huge clusters. So this is Frontier, which is the largest, uh, the largest cluster right now. Uh, well, these are multiple, but Frontier is the latest one. Uh, and Frontier is the first exaplot machine which means that I can reach, I forget exactly how many powers of 10, but many powers of 10. And these are some statistics. It has like some number of nodes. Each processor has these, this type of CPU and this type of memory and so on. Uh, and so these are like individual nodes. These don't necessarily have to depend on the overall cluster, but things that you have to decide when you build a cluster are like the interconnect, uh, this is like hardware interconnect. This is the topology, which is the way that they're connected. Um, yeah, I guess the power is something separate too. Okay, so yeah, we're moving on to topology. So for a while, for distributed memory processors, they were a collection of microprocessors and communication was performed by di bidirectional queues. So they're connected by queues between the nearest neighbors in this, in some kind of topology. And they implement store and forward, which is like, if, you, if you're not directly connected to the thing that you want to send the message to, you, think you have to send it to a neighbor, that neighbor stores it and then forwards it to the next neighbor and so on until you get to what you actually want to do, send it to. And in the beginning, there was a strong emphasis on topology in the algorithms because the algorithm, uh, in some sense, the algorithm time depends on how many hops you need to do to get to where you want to send your message. So if you minimize the number of hops in your algorithm, you can minimize the overall time. In some sense, like the network, you can think of it like, I guess, a street system. So the network is connected by links. The links are like streets, and they have switches between the links, and those are intersections to route you in the correct direction. Uh, the distances or the number of hops that you need to travel is the number of blocks that you need to travel like in a street, and a routing algorithm, which is independent of the street system, is a travel plan, which is like upfront, you have to determine which, not necessarily upfront, but at some point you have to determine which links you're gonna take to get to your destination. Okay, 
Uh, we talked about these measures, but we're going to recap them a little bit. Uh, there are two main properties of the network. The first one is latency, which we have been using tau for. And the latency is how long to get between the nodes in the network. And in the street analogy, it's the time for one car to move along the street from the source to the destination. Uh, so it's the distance the distance divided by the speed of the unit is in time. And this doesn't matter how many cars or how much data you're sending. Uh, however, for bandwidth, that's how much data can be moved per unit time. Uh, and bandwidth is, uh, you can realize like, there's some max bandwidth in your machine, but you can't realize the max bandwidth until you send enough things through the network. So if we're going to do the street analogy, that's like kind of like the width of your street, like how many cars per hour can move through this street. And obviously you cannot fill the bandwidth if you don't have enough cars moving through the street. So yeah, uh, from a hardware perspective, the network bandwidth is related to the bit rate per wire, which is some function of the actual wire and the number of wires. Uh, it may not be exactly those two things times each other because parallelism is hard, but um, it is related to them. And this is just an illustration for the bandwidth and the latency. And bandwidth is, uh, we use mu for bandwidth. So uh, to recap, do people remember, like, if you have to send a message of size m bytes, how do you uh, express this in terms of tau and mu? Uh, tau plus. Like, you have to incur the latency up front, but the latency you don't have to incur the latency every single, or sorry. Like if you're sending cars to the street, if one is following right after the other, then like the second one is not, you don't have to start the second one after you finish the first one. So that's why it's tau plus, because you incur the latency up front once, and then everybody is kind of following after that. And then uh, depending on your unit for bandwidth, I usually think of it, it could be m over mu, it could be mu times m. You just have to depend, like if, uh, if this is bytes per, second, then, um, yeah, I guess then you would you have to divide because you want it also in seconds, you know, or you want the time units to line up. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's, you don't multiply by the latency, you have to always incur the latency no matter how many bytes you're sending, so it's plus, and then bandwidth you multiply because that is some, that is related to how many things you're sending. Uh, yeah, depending on what your mu is, like if your mu is bytes per second, or yeah, you just have, you have to know what unit your bandwidth is for, but like you want both things to be in, in seconds, to be, or you both want both things to be in time. So latency is expressed in time, and then bandwidth then has to be in time to line up. So if you're sending like m bytes, and bandwidth is bytes per second, you get the number of seconds you divide bytes by bytes per second. Thank you. Um, so there are other factors when you design a network. One of the main ones is topology, which is how the things are connected underneath in the hardware. And that is something that doesn't change with the algorithm that is like fixed upfront when you design the network. And there are so many topologies. We're gonna do a few today, and we're gonna do way more later when we talk about interconnect networks, interconnect networks in more detail. Uh, some examples, the lacrosse bar, ring, tree, butterfly. There's like so many of these. The main one that we're gonna to focus today is Hypercube, but there are a lot. And there's a routing algorithm which is independent of the underlying hardware. And the routing algorithm is in software, which is how messages move through the network. So that can be either a physical thing in your hardware or logical. So for example, like if you logically, if you are doing like a 2D matrix algorithm, for example, and you logically lay out your processors in this 2D format, then um, often one common pattern is like you move the thing, you move your data like left to right or up to down. Yeah, and then routing algorithm is just like how do you route the data through these processors. Okay. Another couple of considerations, uh, the switching strategy, which is also like a network hardware thing. Um, one is circuit switching, which is that you have to reserve your entire path for your data, and then another one is packet switching, which is like you break up your data into packets, just like just normal networking, and then you send your packets 
through the data, but they don't have to all go through at once. And then another one is flow control, which is if you have congestion, like if multiple people are trying to send to the same thing, uh, what do you do if there's congestion? So you can wait, uh, you can store the data temporarily, you can reroute the data to other places, uh, you can ask the source node to wait. Also, like you can wait as the destination, you can ask the source node to wait. Uh, you can throw away the data, I guess. Not ideal, but you can ask the source to send it again. Uh, and that is called flow control. So there are many, these are also networking algorithms. Okay. Uh, relating to latency, there are, yeah, so the latency between two nodes, or yeah, the latency between any two nodes in the overall network is bounded above, or is related above to the diameter, which is like if you think of your network as a graph, the diameter is the maximum path length between any two nodes. It's just a property of graphs. And of course, like the latency, like if you have to send between these two very far nodes, then you have to send at least through the links that connect them through the shortest path. And the latency is the delay, again, like we said, between the send and receive times. And there are, like, hard, there are different kinds of latency. The first one is hardware latency, which is just like a function of your wire. And that's like something that the vendor can report to you. And then when you actually write the program, there's also software latency, which is uh, related to the user program. Like once you send it through the wire, you also have to pass it through the layers of the networking stack, which also takes time. And so there's hardware overhead, which is the cost to just send the bits through the wire. And then there's the software overhead, which is passing it through the stack. And usually the hardware latency, um, it is related to the distance, but the software latency is actually higher. So Hardware latency is like tens to hundreds of nanoseconds per hop that you're going to do, and software overhead can be maybe even like in the order of microseconds. So that's higher. Yeah, and often and yeah, so you mostly care about latency if you have many small messages, because if you go back to this question that we had, like um, how is mu m over mu, then um, like when m is large, then the second part will dominate. But if mu is small, then the first part will dominate. Uh, this is just some data about latency over time. Again, or yeah, down is good. I think one is like the best performance so far. 100 is like relative, this is relative performance. X-axis is time. And these different things are Combination of combination of machine and software. So you can see like it's sometimes in the second part it's written like MPI, which is the software that we use to do message passing. So like I said, the latency is dependent on both the software and the hardware. And you can see like in I don't know 30 years, this has improved about 100 times, which is not as fast as Moore's law grows. Um, so we talked about latency, then bandwidth is the number of, it's like the time per bit, basically. And bandwidth is usually measured in gigabytes per second, so it's volume over time. And effective bandwidth is usually, like, again, like the vendor can report to you a maximum bandwidth. And the effective bandwidth is usually lower than that because there's packet overhead. Like, if you use packets, there's data, but then there's also metadata that goes along with your packet. There's, like, headers. There's error, there's like what tells you where the end is. Um, so that's why you, like effective bandwidth is just bytes per second, basically. So if you have to send extra bytes in addition to the stuff that you actually care about, then the, the observed bandwidth are the things that you care about is less. And bandwidth is important if you have large messages, because like I said, then the second term is larger. And then bandwidth, again, is dependent on the software and the hardware. So this is, the x-axis is the size of your message, and the y-axis is the sustained bandwidth that it can achieve. And you can see that it's going up, usually, with the larger sizes, because um, you're taking, if you send larger messages, you're taking more advantage of the, of the hardware. And on the right side, like, this is the, this is the legend, and you don't have to understand all of it, but the important part is that, again, like, on the left side, the slash is 
the machine, and on the right side is the implementation of how you did the message passing. So this is like MPI, this is Shmem, and the two lines are different. And that's why software also matters. Questions so far? Questions? Okay. So latency and bandwidth are, those are like very practical things. Um, they're reported in the hardware and also you can measure them through micro benchmarks or in your actual program. Uh, when you, so this bisection bandwidth is more of a, more of a theoretical notion because you can think of your network as a graph. And bisection bandwidth is just, um, it's dependent on the graph topology of your network. It's not like, not measured in like seconds or bytes or anything. It's just how many, um, yeah, it's the bandwidth across the narrowest part of the network, which is how many, how many like links did you have to cut to disconnect the network? So in this topology, which is just a line, the bisection cut is, bisection bandwidth is one. That is, you can just cut this one or any of them, and then the link, the graph is disconnected. However, in this 2D representation, the bisection cut is through the, all of these, like through this horizontal part or through this vertical part. Um, not this green one, because this is not minimal. The blue one is minimal. So that's bisection bandwidth, which is the, uh, the bandwidth across the narrowest part, um, like the minimal number of cuts you need to make. And that's also just like a graph theory notion. And yeah, bisection, is, bisection bandwidth is relevant when all of the processors need to correspond with all of the other processors. Sorry, can you say it again? What is network here? Oh, sorry, network is just like the the cluster. Um, like we have multiple nodes in the cluster and then the cluster is connected through a network. Like the machines are connected through a network, which is some uh, some hardware setup of these links. Yeah, some, like in these examples, well, usually um, not all the, like these are nodes and these are the links. You can see that not all the nodes are connected to all the other nodes because in practice, n squared is too many links to make like hardware wise. So you have to decide on some underlying network topology which uses less than n squared links. And then once you have decided that, then these are just performance properties of that network. Like bisection bandwidth is a property of the, uh, of the graph that you have decided that your cluster is going to implement. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yes, thank you. Um, this is, yeah, this is how data moves through your cluster. And um, when building a cluster, you always have to pick like this network topology up front, usually when you build the hardware. But the software, like the logical software implementation of algorithms does not necessarily need to exactly follow the underlying hardware implementation. The hardware implementation just guarantees that you can route from every process, usually from every processor to every processor, but not necessarily in one hop. And the, but like it may be convenient for you in algorithms to think of, for example, like if you're doing matrix algorithms, it may be convenient for you to arrange your processors logically into a 2D grid, even if that's not necessarily how the underlying hardware implements it. Does that make sense? Thank you. So we can move on. Uh, the simplest topology is a line. So you have your nodes, each, they're all connected like, they're not all connected to each other, just everybody has one neighbor. The diameter is n minus one, because that's the shortest, the shortest, shortest path between like any two nodes, or like max over any of the paths. Um, and the average distance is n over three, the bisection bandwidth is one because you can cut any of these links and then it would become disconnected. Uh, slightly more complicated is a ring. So like a ring would be just if you added one at the end to connect the end to the start. The diameter is now n over two. The average distance is n over four. And the bisection bandwidth is two because you need to now cut two links to disconnect this graph. And the ring is usually pretty natural if your algorithm is on 1D arrays. You can think of your algorithm as if you have like n data, you cut n over p parts, and then you give n over p to everybody, and they may need to like rotate 
around. Okay. Slightly more complicated is if your algorithm, uh, you can think of these for higher dimensional algorithms, like two dimensional. So if your processors are laid out in this mesh, it means they're laid out in the square pattern. Everybody has three or four neighbors, depending on if you're, or two, two, three or four neighbors, depending on where you are in the square. And the diameter is related to square root of n. The bisection diameter is also square root of n, because it's square root of n by square root of n. And yeah, this is 2D. And then if you did like a, a ring on each of these, that would become a torus, um, like that. And this generalizes to higher dimensions, so it's illustrated in 2D, but you could do it in 3D or so on. Um, for example, this Cray machine, one of the old machines at NERSC, which is a national lab related computing facility, uses 3D torus as their underlying representation. And this is natural for if you use like 2D or 3D arrays, like matrix algorithms. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, this is like if you just had a line here, like this is a line and this is a line. And then, like, this is a ring and this is a ring. And so like you can see the, like over there, the diameter was n to n over two, and now this diameter is like two square root n to square root n. And similar for the bisection bandwidth, it doubles, which is what we had as well. Like before the bisection bandwidth was one, but now it became, it was one, it became two. This is square root of n, it becomes two square root of n. So it's just the same, but like you copied it square root n times. Any questions so far? Um, so the main type of uh, use topology and also permutation of sending in some sense that we're going to talk about in this class is called hypercubic permutation. Uh, the name is a little scary, but it's actually not that complicated. So when we want, want to model communication, the simplest way that we can do it is that you have multiple parallel nodes, and in each parallel step, each one can send at most one message, and each one can receive at one, most one message. Um, and they don't have to necessarily send and receive from the same node. They can send and receive to different places, but we can only send and receive one message at a time. And yeah, if you have permutations, then you can avoid conflicts because everybody would be sending or receiving from different places. And that's how you can maximize like the communication that you can do per second with this model. So in this setup, uh, for example, if you had eight processors, like let's say you're sending from these processors and I happen to order them in this order, just zero to seven, but you could order them in any way you want. And the like you permute, you permute zero through seven and then you send to those and yeah so then there's no conflicts because everybody is sending somewhere else and yeah so that's permutations and you can if you write the sources in implicit order you can just write the permutation of the destinations to denote any permutation but um yeah but like it's important to remember that you don't have to send there's no actual ordering to the sending you just we just have to write them in some order but they can all occur in parallel so they may occur in any order And yeah, so if you have a permutation, or if you have a communication pattern that follows a permutation, then it can be realized in any order and it can be realized in parallel, like maximally efficiently in this network because there's no congestion. Uh, however, uh, there are key factorial communication patterns. And just based on the sources and destinations, and there's also further variation in the communication patterns, like not everyone has to be involved in every in every phase, the message, message sizes can be different, and not everybody needs to start their communication at exactly the same time. Because, like, the it's not necessarily guaranteed that the programs are running in lockstep across all the nodes. And also, the programs that they're running may not be the same. So, 
you get some variations, and then this is just an example of a permutation. But if we had, um, yeah, but if we had a network that could route arbitrary permutations, that would be convenient because then we could avoid um, congestion. So ideally, if all the all the nodes were connected to all the other nodes, this is called all connected network. If we had theta n squared links, then of course we could realize any permutation efficiently. Uh, but in practice, n squared links is too many links from a hardware perspective. So um, we would like to reduce the number of links ideally to something close to, I guess p, which here is also like I use p and n interchangeably here. So p is an p and n are both the number of processors in this slide. The ideal number of links would be close to p, and it turns out that there is a network called the ben Ben's network, and that can route permutations efficiently without conflicts using um, it's around p, it's like two p log p links. So this is a really nice theoretical notion, um, and this is a picture of it. So it uses n log n links, which is not that many, uh, not much overhead at all. But however, it's impractical because you need a centralized planner. You need to this is the network, but you need to implement the routing algorithm. Like given a permutation, the Venn network comes along with a routing algorithm to figure out which links get followed to implement that permutation. And it needs a centralized planner, so one of the nodes has to use, has to have like all P information to implement the routing algorithm, and that would take too long. But it is a nice theory, like there's a nice theory about this. So um, one really popular type of permutation or network that came around, I don't know, it was really popular in the beginning of distributed computing because a lot of algorithms are easily mapped into this type of network, which is called hypercubic permutation. And in hypercubes, if you have n nodes, which is 2 to the d for some dimension d, uh, the diameter is d, the bisection bandwidth is n over 2, and the way that they're connected is you index every node with some d bit string, and nodes are connected to other nodes only if they differ in exactly one bit. So every node in this thing is connected to d other nodes because there are d bits and there are only d other things that differ in one position. Yeah, they communicate only if their ranks differ in one position in this bit string representation. And yeah, ranks are just like the indexing of your nodes. You can, if you have n nodes, you can, the ranks go from zero to n minus one. Yeah. This is called gray code addressing. It's differing by one bit thing, but yeah. So, and hypercubes can extend into arbitrary dimensions. In 3D, it's a cube. And this was really popular in early distributed computing, and they, it turns out that a lot of algorithms can be easily implemented on hypercubes. Yes? Um, of course. Yes? Um, so, n squared links connect every node of correctly mm -hmm. Why would there be like overhead in Oh. Sorry, these are two separate things. Like okay. this n squared links and Ben's network are different. Yeah, sorry. N squared is just like the easy, like the most straightforward all connected network. Like everybody is connected to everyone else and there's no overhead. You figure out an order of one, but from it, it's really hard to implement n squared links like in the hardware. It's too many. Uh, so to try to reduce the number, um, you want to bring it closer to P and there is this theoretical network that can use P log P links, but then you have to use routing, like upfront routing. Yes. Here, uh, I meant to say P, but and and also in the other slide, like I use N as to the D. So here, here there is no problem size, really. Like we're just talking about networks. So, okay, so N is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so sorry, this is, N is the number of processors in this, and P is also the number of processors. Yes, exactly. 
yeah, because in the great kill one, um, you know who you're connected to and you know where you're trying to go. So you can, uh, you can dynamically figure out like, just, you know which bits you differ from your destination. Yes, you need to, the route is determined when you get the permutation. Like the permutation is determined in the algorithm, like which processors are going to send to which other processors. And then the Ben network is something underneath. And that would have, to, the algorithm gives the network the, the sources and destinations that it needs to send. And then the underlying network needs to figure out how to route those messages to the actual nodes. Even the network connection topology depends on the no, the network permutation or the network topology is independent. The permutation is like a software or algorithm level thing. It's like uh, that example that I gave, like p equals eight. That's saying like from an algorithm, like when you write your algorithm, you say, for example, like processor one needs to send something to processor two, and then it's the job of the underlying network to figure out which which link it's going to take to write that message. Um. Because it takes time, it takes, you have to run like flow algorithms to figure out the routing. And that may, that usually takes more time than the actual routing that you're trying to do, or even the algorithm that you're trying to do, depending on your algorithm. So, yes. Why do you need to think about it in Docker when it's the hard writing process, or would that need to be kind of like, you know, black box? Why can't you just say send to the computer and have a hard writing around the opposite way to do it? Um, when you actually write MPI, that is what happens. Um, but it is important because it's kind of like a lower level thing. Like if you are, so from, when you write MPI, you have like, we'll see it later, but you have like send and receive, for example. And in send and receive, you just need to put like your source and destination. But if you were to, at a lower level, implement like some, like in the next programming assignment, for example, we're going to implement the, some of the collectives, which are like, some of the MPI operations. And those can be more efficiently implemented sometimes if you follow certain permutations. Like for example, hypercubes. Like if you know that you only need to implement hypercubic permutations, um, that is much easier than implementing arbitrary permutations. Yes, you could, um, and that's like that's an application level thing, right? Like, the like MPI has no control over where you send your data. Um, however, MPI, like if you send, is how do you say this? Like in MPI, in the lower level, one level underneath, like depending on if you send it, you want to route the most efficient path between any two points. If you happen to choose the farthest two points, either in your network or in this permutation, then it's fine, like you have to do it, but um, there are le like more and less efficient ways to go between any two points. And there's always like the further spin between any two points, but you want to realize the minimum distance between any two. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, good, really good question. Um, you don't ever have to really think about these in MPI, but uh, when you think about like implementing the actual primitives or when you think about the network, it helps to write algorithms that are more related to the network or more related to the primitives. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on. In hypercubic permutations, yeah, you can efficiently send if you differ in just one. So, like, J is a fixed index, and for D equals three, J can range between zero and two. And because these if they differ in just one bit because they're neighbors, you can officially send them because they're neighbors. Okay, uh, we're gonna do a slight, like we've done this, I think, we've done parallel sum before on P processors. We have N numbers and we have P processors. And we're just gonna show how you do this efficiently using hypercubic permutations. The reason that we are interested in hypercubic permutations is, like I said, there's P factorial, central permutations that you could route. And of course, 
a picture-based permutations is a subset of the p factorial permutations. It turns out that you can map a lot of algorithms well into these kinds of patterns. Basically, because a lot of algorithms rely on tree reduction, and hypercubic permutations are well mapped to tree reduction. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do sum. We uh, recall that the serial runtime is n, and the parallel runtime is n over p plus log p, because you split the data n over p ways, and then you aggregate them log p in a tree. And we're going to ignore for a second how they get the data because because uh, it gets a bit complicated. Like usually your data is all on one processor up front, like processor zero, for example, and you need to get it onto the other processors without um, without wasting time. Like this n over p is like computation time, the time to sum up n over p numbers. But if you had to send n over p numbers across the network up front. That would be way worse, and you would already be worse than the serial runtime. So um, we're going to ignore that for now. We're going to assume that everybody has <laughs> the data that they need. Um, but from a practical perspective, you often have to worry about getting the data in the right place. Uh, and sometimes you don't have to worry about it. Like, for example, if your algorithm has much more work to do than data size, then it's fine. But because some is such like a lightweight algorithm, that's why uh, it becomes a problem, Like, because the communication cost is high relative to the Algorithm cost. Okay. So if you remember this sum of n numbers, first step is you add your local p numbers, and then this is this is using the hypercubic permutation for j up to d minus one, where d is your bit string. Uh, you send like your neighbors in this. You send depending on where you are, like if you're the right neighbor or the left neighbor, you either send your sum or you receive the sum and then you add it into your partial sum. So I will show you a picture in a second. Actually, I can just show you now and then we'll come back to it. So this is the tree sum that we're going to do. Like in the beginning, d is zero. So true to the d, sorry, in the beginning, j is zero. So true to the j is one. And then the difference, so the neighbors are like one apart. And so the even numbers in true to the j plus, in true to the j are going to send to the left neighbor and then they're going to add their number. And then in the next round, j is now 1. So the distance becomes 2. So these are 2 apart. And then j equals 2, and the distance is now 4. So they are 4 apart. Um, going back to the code, that is, there's two cases. There's send, and then there's receive. Or receive and add, I guess. And this is just sending along your neighbors in the hypercubic permutation. And then at the end, if your rank is zero, you just print every the answer conventionally the answer shows up on rank zero, but it's not necessary that that's the case. Like you could put it on anywhere. Oh yeah, and there's a slight Error in the initial code, which is that once you have sent, um, once you have sent your data, you are no longer participating in any of the following rounds, and that's why there's exit. Questions? Okay, then we can move on. We're going to do a little bit of MPI. So MPI is MPI stands for message passing interface, and uh, it's basically now like the de facto standard for programming distributed memory machines. In the beginning, like in the 80s and the 90s, there used to be a lot of different software tools for writing distributed message passing programs. But in 94, MPI 1.0 is released uh, as a standard for distributed and shared memory, and now we are mostly writing MPI. And standards are good because they can run everywhere, if people can agree. Okay. So uh, in message passing, there is communication and there's synchronization, but you have to use subroutines. So like send, receive, for example. Uh, there are no more shared variables. So it's not shared memory anymore. It can run on shared memory machines, but from a programming perspective, the 
tasks or like the processors are all separate. And the programmer, the programs can run a single processor machine, except for the calls to the message processing library. There's subroutines for communication. So the basic ones are point to point communication, which are send and receive. So send, like you send from somewhere to somewhere else. And then there are collectives, which are all processors do something like gather, broadcast, like broadcast would be like uh, you define a source and then that sends some data to everybody else. Gather and gather, which we'll talk about. And then you can do compute, like sum, product, reduce, so on. On many processors, there are already routines for a lot of these. There's synchronization barriers. So like if you need to wait for all the processors to finish their thing before moving on, you can synchronize. And then there's basic metadata inquiries, like how many processes are there? Uh, which process am I? And are there waiting messages that I need to take before I continue? Okay, so this is how you use MPI. You include mpi.h at the beginning of your file, and then you can start using the MPI functions to compile it uh, on case. You use mpi.cc, which is the compiler. This is your .c file and your output file, dash o. And to run it on the cluster, you use srun, which is like sending it to the uh, sending it to the job cluster or the job machines, I guess. And this is like the binary. These are in the homework. We have provided make files and scripts to run the thing, just as an example. And I don't want people to get stuck on it. But just important to remember that on the cluster. Uh, unless you use an interactive session, which is like you allocate a node for yourself, uh, it's not right to run the jobs on your node. Like, so there's two kinds of nodes. There's login node, and then there's interactive nodes, like which actually run the programs. And you don't want to run your code on the login node. Like, you can run it to make sure that it works, but you don't want to run any numbers on it. So um, that's what srun is. Like, you send your job to somewhere else, and then you get the result, and you get the time if you ask for the time. Uh, the default imp implementation of MPI is MAV pitch. Uh, it's not that relevant what it is, but just that if you do local development, you would want to get the implementations to line up. But you can just do all your development on pace to avoid it. I guess. Is the compiler also parallelized? You may have to pass something. You may have to pass the compiler flags into it to get it to parallelize. I'm actually not sure. I will check and get back to you. Yeah, I know like in make you can sometimes parallelize it, but I don't know if this particular compiler can be parallelized. Okay. So the the main, I guess like the, the way that MPI processes are gathered is called a communicator, which is just a communication. It's like the universe for all your processes and it's called MPI com world, which is like the object in your code that you can query for like the size and the number of processes and stuff like that. And every pro there are, if there are p processors, there are they are labeled zero to p minus one, and each of them like their index is called a rank. And almost every MPI command you need to provide the communicator as an input argument, just to specify like which communicator you are using to do your computation. And in the beginning of time, the com world has all of the processors in it. Everybody, every process has a rank, which is just this integer identifier that is within the communicator that tells you which rank, like which process you are. And the rank goes between zero and processors minus one, and it is used to tell which processor is which. So, and then you can query the size of the communicator, which is how many processes there are, and you can also query which rank you are with the MPI com rank. And those are useful because uh, it is often helpful to know how many processors there are. Like for example, if you have, if you need to process n data and everybody has to do n over p, you need to know p to split it up. Yeah. So this is example usage. You have in size and my rank. And this is how you call it MPI com size and MPI rank. You pass in com world and you pass in a pointer to the size or rank and then you can print the size of the rank and you can use them in your program uh, like here. If my rank is zero, then you can do something. Each process it executes separately. Like when you write MPI code, um, 
you write like, for example, your main, like int main, and you write some stuff in it, every process is executing that separately. Yes, like if you only have one, if you only have one rank, then that would just be like the same as regular serial code. And, and if you, so like this process is still running on the same. It may be better to think of it in terms of how many ranks you have, because processor is like a. A more complicated thing, like for example, you can write MPI programs on one node, and there you have multiple processes. But I guess in some sense, you, could, you only have one processor, depending on your definition of processor. Like if, if a node is a processor, you can have multiple ranks per node. Um, here, here, let's just say that these are processes Every rank is one process, and um, every rank is executing your function or your, your, your code separately, independently. So like this would be executing on everything, and then my rank would be different for every process or every rank. Yes. Uh, there is an init step. The init step does not require that they all communicate, but like you don't pass in, you never, you don't need to just specify how many ranks there are. Like the number of ranks there are is determined uh, usually by like the parameters that you ran the thing with. Yeah, you identify the processes by the ranks. Sorry, yes. Because nothing verify like. You don't really have control over the assignment of ranks and processes, I think. Um, no, like the ranks are set up front. Um, maybe it may help. I think there are maybe some code examples later, but like in, in it, you don't have to say like process zero is rank whatever. Like the, that is automatically determined. And the number of, you don't have to have, you don't really set like I want this many ranks up front. Like that is determined by whatever like outer parameters you ran it with, like how many. Uh, threads, for example, or how many nodes or something. Yeah. Question. Maybe we can do like a couple examples and then we can come back to the question. Yeah. Okay, so there are these commands, the six most important MPI commands. In the beginning of every MPI program, you have to write MPI init, which tells you that you're going to use MPI. At the end, you have to use MPI finalize, which is telling that the MPI computation is finished. There's comp size, which we just saw the example, which is how many process, processes are participating in this, um, are in the communicator. There's MPI com rank, which is which rank am I? There's send, which is uh, send a message to a given process from me. And then there's receive, which is receive a message from a given process. And these all, these each have source and destination. Uh, it depends on the implementation of MPI. Yeah. Um, it could be done through a broadcast. Yes. Yeah, it's like the communicator is available to every process because every process can query like the size and the rank. For example, and the communicator is a parameter, like 
to pass in the communicator into when you query for size and rank so that it's accessible to every process. Yes, uh, not, I guess not exactly because my rank is also from the communicator. And so um, you don't know like what what's like what is the struct definition of communicator, but I guess like the rank would be different. There's some there's a parameter for my rank and that is different for every rank, but the size would always be the same. Um probably. Maybe. I don't know if they need, I think maybe just like press rank zero would tell everybody like how many there are. Really, that might be easier. Okay. Um, good questions? Okay. All right, so this is just an example of how you write Hello World. So you have to init first, which is everybody has to, this is main, everybody has to call init. And then, yeah, so this is asking how many total processors are there. So you make this world size parameter and you pass it in to com world and that gives you the total number of processes. Uh, and then you ask, which is my rank? So it's like similar usage to com size, but just with my rank. And com size is the same for everybody in the communicator, but rank is not, rank is unique for your process. There's also this additional metadata, which is what is my processor name? You don't usually use this, but this is just for the purposes of Hello World illustration. And we're going to print hello from this processor. We're going to, um, this is the name, rank D out of D. Uh, this is just C, like string parsing, uh, rank my rank out of total number of ranks. And then you call MPI finalize. And that's when you're finished. Yeah, so this MPI program, like this hello world, is run on every single process. So like the code that we wrote is copied and run. And this is how you run it, for example, in the cluster. And I asked for two nodes, which is N2, and I asked for four tasks per node. And then that is eight, because two times four is eight. And this is the example output. So I guess ATL zero is the node that I was running on. This is the rank zero between zero and eight, and you have total number of eight processes. So even though it was running on two nodes, the ranks still are in the correct range and the total number of processes is correct. Here it is the no number of nodes times the number of tasks per node. The, you can, the number of processes is like the number of nodes that you have times the number of processes per node. So here there are two nodes and four processes per node. And I just used two nodes to illustrate that the name would be slightly different. Uh, like halfway through, you mean? Um, here they are not. The order is not guaranteed. Um, probably. Yeah. Here I think it was for convenience that they are happen to be nice, but they're just out of order. Um, yeah, so then there's also synchronization primitives in MPI. Some parallel algorithms require you to do synchronization, which means that no processes are going to continue past some point until all of them have reached that point. And that is implemented with MPI barrier. You pass in the communicator. So you just put this like in the point in your code that everybody needs to get to. And you can do implicit synchronization. You can implement it yourself with send and receive. And then, yeah, so how do you tell if you need a barrier? You can ask this, like if process one 
is way faster than process two, is the final result still correct? Uh, it's in the communicator. Yeah. Uh, the world size is in the communicator. Like the way that we queried the world size, the communicator was one of the arguments. When we asked like MPI com size or MPM com rank, like the communicator is the first argument, and the second argument is like the things that you want to fill. What is the authentication process? Like, say, three processes have an MPI in it, then. How does MPI make I see. Like here, there's no parameter. So far, there are no parameters to MPI in it, like in this example. Uh, usually now, as convention, they leave them empty. I think it's more like a feature thing that there are parameters at all. Um, the way that they know which processes are going to run related to this is when you pass um, when you pass in like the number of tasks, like when you allocate the number of tasks up front. Here, for example, I did Salak, this thing is allocating an interactive node with, or interactive nodes, I guess, with two nodes and four tasks per node. And then I did S run, which is how you run it on this interactive node. So you can see that like neither, in, and then MPI hello world is just the binary. So in S run, we didn't specify how many processes there are. We only asked for some number of processes when we allocate the node. I see. So, like, if you in parallel ran two binaries, like two MPI binaries, for example, yeah, you just ran hello world like twice, like twice in parallel, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the nodes or all the processes would participate in both hello worlds. Uh, yeah. Like in this it, later on, I think like you can make new communicators in your MPI code, so you can like limit the number of ranks. And you could also separate them into groups. But in the beginning of time, like every, they just use all the ranks. Every binary would use all the ranks, and you can limit that if you want. Um, it's kind of like in multi threading. If you write multi threaded programs and you ran two in parallel, if you don't limit the threads they use, they all will use all the threads. And the scheduler maps them somehow into the threads. So the same here, like you would, um, yeah, this uses all of it. And if you ran it, like, if you ran a parallel copy, it would also use all of them. Um, yeah, so this is just an example of using barrier. If you wanted to order your output, so remember that you're not guaranteed to have them ordered in Hello World, you can put a barrier in, you can put a loop over the world size from zero up to world size, which is the number of ranks. You can put a barrier inside here. And then if only if you, your rank, is equal to i, which is the ranks in order, then are you going to print your thing? So this is going to give you the prints in order, and then the start and the end are the same. Yeah. And then again, you copy this thing on all the processes, and now the ranks are in order. Uh, 
Um, so like when you allocate an interactive node, you only have a view into, you You don't get like, for example, if you ask for two nodes, you don't get like two terminals. You get one terminal on one of the nodes, usually like zero, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but good question. Like, I guess for simplicity, so you don't get like one printout per node, rather you just get one. But you could also force this like, um, uh, I guess like in the sum example, we did like if think equals zero, then you print the sum. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. So yes, that is a really good question. If you request P nodes, you do not get P terminals, you get one. And then you run S run to run on the P nodes. Oh, yeah, but here I forced it through this if condition. Like, everybody has to get here, and then only if you are equal to, you are iterating zero up to world size, and then only if you are equal to, your rank is equal to the current index that we're at, will you print your thing. So is this for being run on all processes? Yes. So, like, each process could independently get, could independently get this. Yeah, like everybody would get here independent, or like we would synchronize, and then everybody would have to come here. And then you can't keep going around the four because there's another barrier. The barrier is in the four. Yeah, so like, yeah. There's one printout per iteration. Thank you. Okay. Good. Questions? Okay. All right, so that is Hello World and MPI. The most basic message passing is send and receive. And like the easiest way to think about it, you have two processors, process zero and process one. And process zero calls send of data to process one. And process one needs to call a corresponding receive of the data. Things that you have to specify, which is how is the data described? Like how big is it? What type is it? How is the process identified? Like how do you, how do you know which rank you're sending to? How does the receiver recognize that that is the message that it's supposed to get? And what does it mean to finish send and receive? So one uh, definition of finishing send and receive is like you cannot proceed until the destination has received your data. Another definition is that once you like ship your packet, you can move on. So the way that you encapsulate the data is called an MPI message. And basically a message is an array of data elements and it's inside some envelope where the envelope contains some metadata as well. Like the start address of the message, how many elements there are that you're gonna send and the type. And yeah, so that's corresponding to the actual data. And then envelope is like, which, what is the source and the destination? Some tag, which may be a unique identifier and the overall communicator. So yeah, the MPI data types are triples. I guess my data is a triple, which is like an address, like a, like a pointer in your memory space, a count of how many things you're gonna send and the data type, which shows you the size. And the data type, it's not that important, but um, there are predefined data types like int and double, which are probably the ones you're gonna use. You can also define recursively like how you define structs with int and double and so on. Uh, and as long as you, you could also define your own data types and then make an array of those data types to send as well. And then you can also make, yeah, you can make structs, you can do striding in your data type if you want. But most, almost all the time you just send like a, just a contiguous array of data. And one important thing to note is um, you can write MPI with C++, but you cannot send like arbitrary C++ types through MPI. Like you can only pretty much send contiguous type. Like you can send std array. You not you can't send like std set, for example, or um, like std map, because it's not really well defined. Like if you send pointers through message passing to other nodes, like what that means. Yeah. So you can make these custom data types. 
usually for subarrays. And if your data types are complicated, your performance may suffer. But in this class, we are just pretty much going to be sending ints. Yes. Uh, yeah, you could rewrite it yourself as a contiguous data structure, or you could, if you don't need to send the exact structure, you can send the array and rebuild it on the other end. Like you can send, for example, you could send an array of ints, and then on the receiving side, you could form, an, you could iterate over that array and then form an SPD set of those ints if you wanted. But you cannot just send like SPD set type. Uh, C++ is fine. C is definitely sufficient, but C++ is fine. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is the syntax for send. You take in a void pointer as the array that you're going to send. How many, which is the count, the data type, the destination, the tag, which is a unique identifier, and the communicator world. And this is a blocking send function, which means that it returns only when the data has been delivered to the system and the buffer can be reused. Uh, the message may not have been received yet by the destination process. But, yeah. So you return only when this communicating communication on the sender's end has finished. And then on the other side is receive, which is very similar. Yes. Uh, the system is like the underlying networking layer. Uh, good question. You cannot confirm with just send. Um, you can do another round of acknowledgement with send. You can have like the send and receive. Then you switch the sender and the receiver. And then on the other side, there's MPI receive, which is very similar. It has the void pointer again, the count, the data type, the source rather than the destination now, the tag, communicator, and then this is new, this is the status. Um, and the status is something that you fill out, I think, receive. So yeah, so this blocking receive, you wait until you get this message. So process zero has to send, like if you have two processes, then you have to get a source, like the source has to match sender. And yeah, and the buffer contains the message that you're going to get. You have to match the data type or the source. So you have to know what size of the thing you're going to receive is. Or you can pass in any source. Also, you don't have to pass in a specific one. This is a, a special variable. Uh, if you want to uniquely identify the particular message, you can pass around unique identifiers, or you can just pass an MPI any tag for, like, if you don't care about the identifier. And you can get fewer than count, but uh, it's going to be a problem if you want to receive more than the count that you passed in. Yes. It's just going to receive I think the rest is just going to be garbage. Like if you get, for example, like let's say in send, you sent five, and then here in count you pass 10. The first five of that array would be the actual elements that you sent, and then the remaining five would be garbage. What if in, the, oh, I see. Like what if, what if there are two sends and then one receive? Oh, um, could be. Yeah, I mean, garbage is anything. Or it might not even read, um, it might not even read those because count, like it, the garbage may not be from the networking layer. The garbage may just be from the array initialization. Like on the, on the receive side, you have to make a buffer of size count, right? And then, 
on the send side, you also send a buffer of size to some other count, but that count that came on the send side came through the metadata as well. Like it's in the, it's from the send command. So like when the receive gets the send, it also can see how many the send told you that it sent. Um, so you don't need to keep reading past what the send told you that it sent. Um, it just needs to be, it just needs to fit in the array that you have allocated. And then it, it may not fully fill this array, in which case then like when you made this void pointer, there was some stuff in there and then the rest is just whatever was already there. Did you answer the question? Cool. Um, so that is send and receive. Guess we can do the simple example and then I'm probably out of time. Um, okay, so assuming that you have two processes and remember that these are the API for send and receive, remember that everybody is running this thing. So um, you init, you make, you get your rank and process zero is gonna send and process one is gonna receive. So if your rank is zero, your buffer, you make some buffer, which is just one int in this example. Uh, you send this int size one, because you're gonna, the, the count is one, the type is MPI int, the destination is one, the tag is zero, doesn't really matter what it is, and then you, send, you pass in the communicator. And otherwise, if your rank is one, then you're the receiver. The parameters are pretty much all the same, except now uh, source is one. And then status is this thing that uh, was initialized here and it gets filled in and received. And then, then you print what you got and analyze. And you should print one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much out of time, so I think we'll stop here and then, oh yes, please. I don't ever think it actually uses those parameters. I think it could, you could pass in null null as well. Yeah, I'm not sure why in this example, I don't remember. But like, if you remember in the hello world, like both were null. Um, and argc and argv are not used here. Cool. Thank you.